nothing but respect for our favorite TV presidents. Welcome to Gamma Ray. Oh, God. Independence Day is coming up in these United States of America, and so we thought it might be a good time for us to hold an official office yeah. debate. I should be president or something. About which of the many fictional presidents that have crossed our living room screens is our favorite. Some are great, some are diabolical, but they understand the privilege, the consequences, the power of their words for good or ill. First up at number seven, we're starting with a curveball. Robert McAllister from the short-lived WB series, Jack and Bobby. Oh, deep cut. Yes, we know he was never technically president on screen as the show's fascinating premise centered around two brothers. No, not like the Rick and Morty two thing. Two brothers. No, don't you do it. Go back. We're doing it. We have serious things to do, okay? A lot of presidents. The moon comes crashing oh, you, you cheeky editor. Putting a Rick and Morty thing about two brothers in there. Oh, relevant for the kids. The show's fascinating premise centered around two brothers, one of whom would grow up to be the president. While the first few episodes tried to keep you guessing, it was eventually revealed that it would be baby Percy Jackson to take on the Oval one day. While technically the show didn't center around the presidency itself, we wanted to give it credit for tackling a larger philosophical theme around the position. Are leaders made, shaped, and groomed by their environment and upbringing, or are they born, refining skills and behaviors ingrained in their DNA somehow? You be the judge, we're on to number six. At number six, we're going to continue to avoid the actual job. We're cowards. We were surprised when we realized the post-presidency was such a gravely underutilized dramatic premise. Thus, we had to give some points to Richard Graves, from Graves. What? The show is filled with endearing performances, light comedy, and Nick Nolte, who takes on the frank, unrepentant character with delight. <sighs> what a prick. Freed from the need to be re-elected, Graves can simply focus on doing what's right and trying to correct the mistakes of his time in office in a way that doesn't apologize for his beliefs, but acknowledges the failure of his choices. Poignant. For movies, there's also My Fellow Americans, which has those two guys from Grumpy Old Men. And then there was, um, uh, it's technically not the president one, but Bullworth is a fun one. Check that out, Warren Beatty. Do you have any more of those little crispy crab cakes? <laughs> At number five, we're hitting the Oval Office, but we're still avoiding the job, passing the buck, it's president things, you get it. Both presidents on Scandal are kind of terrible presidents. No, really, they're very terrible presidents, but we do have a special place in our heart for Tony Goldwyn's Fitzgerald Grant. Oh, Fitz. You emotional abuser, you're the fucking worst. While we have literally no idea what his policies are, he makes for a great, diverse, romantic hero. Heedless in his efforts to maintain his illicit romance, the man invades a foreign country to save his mistress, survives an assassination attempt, like you do, frequently forgets about the existence of his children, right? And has probably had more sex than any other on-screen presidents. I'm the leader of the free world, I do not sleep in. We checked, and that dude gets it in with the quickness. Like seriously, it's no longer like the Oval Office, it's freaking pound town. I don't think he bones that often in the Oval Office, but check it out, I don't know. It's a sexy show. Chandra Rhymes effectively turns the job into a great soap opera and veers into the space so unapologetically that despite the show growing more convoluted and absurd, Fitz was always a fun president to watch. At number four, let's talk about more shit presidents. This time, not because they're spending too much time getting busy, but because they're busy being evil dicks. There's a few honorable mentions. On prison break, Patricia Wedding's Caroline Reynolds started as Veep, but after a Borgia-like poisoning, she upgraded to the president to be a memorable villain. At least she has a spine, unlike Gregory Itzen's Charles Logan for 24, oh my god, fuck that guy, who seemed to be decent and ready to uphold David Palmer's legacy, but ended up being complicit in his assassination, inept at thwarting terrorists, and even guilty of gaslighting his poor wife when she figured out his machinations. This dude sucked. Oh, it's like Iago from Aladdin, but as like a human, and he's also a, a head of state, like, oh, just fucking die. Anyways, the dude sucked. In the end, there's no one who's more hated by his constituents, and now the audience, than the murderous, traitorous, insidious Frank Underwood from House of Cards. Going from a representative from South Carolina to the White House by being a generally vile human being, every time he's given the opportunity to reflect the better nature of humanity, or even the ideals of the American experiment, he often just steamrolls in the opposite direction. He may be a calculated planner, but his ruthlessness is often lacking when it comes to execution. <laughs> it's a pun, he kills a person. A couple people, actually. Anyways, you should see the show. The show makes us nervous about the realities of rule under the dark side of the force. In the end, without saying too much about a show called House of Cards, despite all the cruelty Underwood put into this fictional world, he may not even end up being the most fun to watch president on the show in the end. But, you know, we'll see. We're just getting started. Can we talk about good presidents now? Can we? Oh, thank you. At number three, we wanted to give praise to those who stepped into office utterly unprepared, forced by extreme tragedy, and yet excelled. 
Disqualified by being president of Caprica and not the United States, we really wanted to give the spot to Mary McDonald's Laura Rosalind of Battlestar Galactica, who went from Secretary of Education to the top job overnight. And on the backs of, like, billions of people who died in a robotic, uh, you know, genocide, like you do. She made some early mistakes in season one, but eventually grew to be a skilled and principled leader who never let the wandering tribes forget the real thing they were fighting for. The chemistry between Edward James Olmos and Mary McDonnell. Let's get to him cuddling. It's like your parents. You're really rooting for him. It's cute, but you don't want to see him have sex, you know? But since this is for U.S. presidents, we chose the next best candidate, Tom Kirkman from Designated Survivor. Stepping up to the plate and taking on the presidency while never really having sought it brings both of these characters a level of honor and a level of drama others don't benefit from. Sure, Kirkman is basically a nerdy Jack Bauer forced to sit in the Oval, but that's part of the charm. Like, you're just watching him being like, okay, when is he gonna take off the glasses and punch some guy and like, demand to be like, who ordered the attack? Add to that both a personal and national crisis for a man who was the Secretary of Housing yesterday and now has to take on the top job and it's a recipe for a compelling plot. While the fate of Kirkman's presidency is also keeping us in suspense, it's worth revisiting his two years in office. At number two, we were genuinely surprised by the number of comedic presidents there have been. After his now iconic big screen presidency, there was a charm and decidedly less aliens to Bill Pullman's Dale Gilchrist from the first family sitcom 1600 Pen. Back in 1985, Patty Duke's president Julia Mansfield took on religion, race, politics, and sex in a comedy far ahead of its time. I'm president of the United States. George C. Scott took on the office back in the early days of Fox with Mr. President, produced by Johnny Carson's production company. The show was kind of a mess behind the scenes, but it was entertaining while it lasted. Oh man, there's THE president, voiced by Keith David and Rick and Morty after a giant head appears in the sky <laughs> with a demand. Show me what you got. You know, Rick and Morty. Or there's Lisa Simpson's stint in the Oval Office cleaning up the budget crunch she inherited from a I still can't believe they predicted it. For president Trump. There, we got his name in it. Can't wait to read the comments. But after all the votes were tallied, our favorite comedic champion is the shortest presidency in history. She started out as vice president, but Veep Selena Meyer ascended to the top job after her predecessor resigned, only to immediately start the next campaign cycle and somehow end up with a tie in the Electoral College, which would eventually, and hilariously, result in her losing her job. I'm fluent and bastard. Her identity, and you know, I was gonna say dignity, but did she ever really have what that? I am furious. And now for the number one spot, there's three candidates that really made a good run. First off was President Mackenzie Allen from Commander-in-Chief. Good choice! The show only made it one season, and like almost all female presidents on TV, she wasn't elected, but was another Veep who took over the Oval after her predecessor died. Seriously? Is that how it always goes for every female president? She was an independent in a Republican government, and despite both the dying chief and the current government asking her to step down, she stuck with it. Battling both an administration that didn't want her and a shit ton of behind the scenes real life production turmoil, I didn't know that. Gina Davis delivered a memorable president who tried to do the right thing and deserves an honorable mention. Honestly, we could make an entire list out of the presidents on 24. While we loved the sternness of Allison Taylor and even the utter incompetence of Wayne Palmer, it was the show's first and longest running president, David Palmer, played by Dennis Haysbert that reigns above them all. Nothing but respect for my fictional president. He survived assassination as a candidate, thanks of course to Jack Bauer, but then proceeded to also get through an attempted coup, another assassination attempt, a nuclear bomb, and the twisted plots of his ex-wife Sherry, and despite all that, still managed to remain strong-willed, skilled, and just an all-around decent and trustworthy man. He wasn't perfect, but he was reliable, honorable, and trying his best. Let's all be honest though, much like crackers are just a vehicle for good cheese or tortilla chips are just a vehicle for guacamole, this list is just a vehicle to talk about the true top spot. A fictional man who has yet to be beaten for this position, though we're open to someone someday doing so. Do we have to say it? We do. It's clearly the West Wing's Josiah Bartlett. Raining down Bible verses on bigots, assuming unofficial father figure roles, and otherwise holding his own with word after word of Aaron Sorkin's witty dialogue, Martin Sheen's stint as fake president was unwavering in his idealistic principles. While his presidency was marred with scandal, assassination attempts, and the abduction of his daughter in order to make good TV, his policy decisions were full of tough calls with great reasons. We'd like to believe that if America elected a fictional president, they'd elect Jed Bartlett. That's it for us this week, folks. Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments. Like, subscribe, do all the things, and we'll see you all next week. I'm Woody Zondorf. Enjoy your national holiday if you live in America, and if not, enjoy your Wednesday. <laughs>